Okay, thank you so much, um, Joe and Peter, for having me. Thanks to everybody who is here today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking today fairly broadly about depression and substance use. Um, these are two of the most common forms of psychopathology. They collectively affect about 50 million people each year in the United States alone, um, and that's people who are directly affected by the disorders. That doesn't include their family members, their children, their friends, or their coworkers, or all of the other people who are indirectly affected by them. And um, a few really quick things about me, Joe already mentioned. Um, I'm faculty at the Institute of Child Development here at the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm one of several principal investigators at the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research. This includes several long-standing longitudinal studies of twin and adopted families. Um, my background is in clinical psychology. I'm licensed as a clinical psychology psychologist here in Minnesota State. Um, and my research interests, um, as you might imagine, are in depression and substance use. Um, I'm particularly interested in better understanding how they develop over time and how they're transmitted through families, how they're passed from parent to child. And at this point, I would say that um, I, I've got enough expertise in these areas to know that I'm definitely not an expert in everything. Um, today, I'm hoping to share some of what I've learned um, and what I think are some of the particularly interesting and important aspects of these unfortunately quite common and oftentimes highly impairing disorders. So my goals for today's webinar are to cover at a pretty broad level the phenomenology, course, prevalence, etiology, key risk factors, and the comorbidity and co-occurrence of depression and substance use. A few definitions um, before we get going um, of these terms, just to make sure that we're all starting out on the same page. When I say phenomenology, really what I mean is just a description of symptoms and disorders. So what do depression and substance use and abuse look like? What are their characteristic and defining features? When I say course, I'm referring to what depression and substance use look like over time, how they develop and change over the lifetime. Prevalence refers to rates of symptoms and disorders within a given time period. So how common are depression and substance use and abuse over the course of one's life or during a discrete time period like in the past year? Etiology means cause or origin. Uh, so what causes depression and substance use and abuse? Risk factors refer to things or situations or contexts that increase the likelihood of depression or substance use. And then comorbidity and co-occurrence, they're related, but they're not exactly the same thing. Comorbidity refers to the occurrence of two or more disorders during the lifetime. So are people who experience depression also more likely to experience substance uh, abuse and vice versa, but it doesn't necessarily have to be at the same time. Co-occurrence refers to the occurrence of two or more disorders at the same time or sequentially. So here what we're asking is, are people who experience depression also more likely to experience substance abuse at that same time or immediately following a depressive period? And then vice versa, are people um, who exper experience substance abuse also more likely to be depressed during that period? And one last thing um, before I get going, I want to point out, and maybe you've already noticed, that treatment is pretty noticeably absent from this list. Um, and the reason is that um, talking about treatment could certainly take up its own webinar um, just for depression or just for substance use. And there's still what I consider to be something of a, a lack of consensus in what we as a field consider to be the, the best treatments for people in general or for individuals um, with their own unique circumstances. And, um, it's a somewhat controversial literature. Um, and there have also been several excellent, excellent webinars um, through the center um, that have already covered aspects of treatment. So I definitely encourage you to check those out if you haven't already. Okay, so let's start with the phenomenology of depression. Um, so what does it look like? Everyone experiences some amount of variation in their normal mood from more positive to more negative emotions. And depression is characterized by extreme mood disturbances that last for days or weeks or longer um, and that cause significant distress and impairment. Depressed mood includes extreme negative emotions like sadness, dejection, hopelessness, and irritability. And I think it's important to emphasize because a lot of people don't realize this, that depressed mood isn't just the adding on of negative emotions, it's also the taking away of more positive emotions or the lack of feelings of happiness or pleasure or motivation. So depression can include both negative mood and or the lack of positive mood. 
And if we think about normal mood variation and normal experiences of sadness, which everyone experiences and which are perfectly normal to experience, we can think of somewhat more extreme amounts of negative emotions or that lack of positive emotions as starting to move us into what we might call subclinical depression. And if we go even further, we can define a threshold for what we call clinically significant depression or depressive disorder. And exactly where this threshold is and exactly what it's defined by might vary a bit depending on who you ask. Um, but the, the threshold is typically defined by the frequency or the persistence or the severity of depression and also how much distress it's causing a person, how much it's affecting their functioning. In the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, the DSM-5, defines the symptoms that make up the diagnoses of major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder. Um, and for our purposes, it's less important to focus on the specifics of the diagnostic criteria and more important to notice the broader domains that are affected by these disorders. So for major depressive disorder, we have depressed mood and we also have anhedonia. And that's that lack of interest or pleasure in things that I mentioned earlier. And in order for a person to get a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, he or she needs to be experiencing at least one of those two symptoms, either depressed mood or anhedonia or both. Then we have persistent depressive disorder. This was formerly dysthymic disorder in previous versions of the DSM. And then here we have that depressed mood, um, but it's usually for less, a, a lesser percentage of time, um, but it's also for a much longer period. It has to be for two years or longer in adults. And then in both of these disorders, other domains beyond mood are affected. Um, people with a depressive disorder have appetite and sleep disturbances. They have extremely low energy. They feel bad about themselves or like they've done something wrong. They have trouble thinking and concentrating. They have thoughts of death or dying or of hurting themselves. And some even make plans or attempt to kill themselves. And to be considered a major depressive episode, the depression symptoms need to last for at least two weeks. And most major depressive episodes actually will remit all on their own. Um, remit means to get better, so they'll get better on their own even without treatment. But it's important to know that the average duration of an untreated major depressive episode is six to nine months. And that's a really long time to be feeling depressed. Major depressive disorder is oftentimes a recurrent disorder. This means that it's likely to occur multiple times. About 40 to 50 percent of people who experience one major depressive episode will go on to experience another one at some point in their lives. And even though the majority of people who experience a major depressive episode will recover within a year, even without treatment, about 20 percent will still be in the same episode after two years about 10% after five years, and about 6% will still be in the same episode after 15 years. And that's what's called chronic major depressive disorder. And then we have persistent depressive disorder, what used to be called dysthymic disorder. And the big thing um, I mentioned a little bit that differentiates this is that it only requires depressed mood for about half the time, as opposed to most of the time. Um, and you might think that this means that it's less severe, but it actually can be a particularly impairing disorder. And this is because most people who are first diagnosed with persistent depressive disorder, um, or, or most people first experience in, it in childhood. They might not be diagnosed until they're adults, but they first experience it in childhood. The average age of onset is 10 years old. And the time to recovery without treatment is so long, it averages over five years. And some people, can experience dysthymia for 20 years or longer. About 80% of people with persistent depressive disorder also experience a major depressive episode during that dysthymic episode, and that's what's called double depression. So because of the early onset and the long time to recovery, some people can literally live their entire lives in a dysthymic episode. So depression, it's often recurrent, it's often chronic. And now switching gears a bit toward substance use and abuse, unlike for depression where it's fairly straightforward to define the disorder by extreme depressed mood, defining problematic substance use gets a little bit tricky and this is made somewhat more complicated by issues of legality. So alcohol, for example, is legal to use in the United States by people who are 21 years and older and many people are able to use responsibly and in moderation. 
Many people aren't though. They drink too much, they drink too often, or their drinking negatively affects their lives. And that's when we start to move into what we might consider subclinical or clinically significant alcohol use. Nicotine products, including cigarettes, are legal in the United States for people 18 years and older, but pretty much everyone would agree that there's really no reason to smoke cigarettes at all. There's, they don't do anything good for you, um, and they um, are, are definitely physically harmful. Um, so any use is arguably problematic, and there's evidence that people can become addicted to nicotine very quickly. Vaping is another thing that's been getting a lot of attention recently. At first, it seemed like it might be a way to help smokers quit, um, but now there's emerging evidence that it may not actually be as harmless as people had initially hoped. And then there's cannabis or marijuana, um, and this is illegal in the United States, suggesting that any use is problematic, except for the 11 states where recreational use is now legal by people 21 years and older. And there's a, a total now, I think, of 34 states where medical use is legal. Um, the, the number of states keeps changing. Um, it's, it's a very rapidly shifting um, legalization landscape. Um, and a lot of people argue that marijuana can be used responsibly and moderately, much like alcohol, and that it's only at more extreme levels that its use becomes problematic. And then we have drugs like heroin. Most everyone would agree we shouldn't be using heroin. Um, but heroin is just an illegal opioid, uh, and prescription opioids, when used as prescribed, can be enormously helpful um, in medical contexts. And at the same time, they can also be extremely problematic when they're misused, as in the, the current opioid epidemic that we're experiencing in the United States and around the world. Okay, so depending on the, the substance and the legal context, we might think that occasional moderate use of substance, substances might be okay. Um, but there comes a point where use becomes problematic. And at some point, we can define a threshold for what we'd call clinically significant substance use or substance use disorder. And this threshold is typically defined by the quantity of substance use um, and also by how much distress it's causing a person, how much it's affecting their functioning or um, affecting the other people around them. And these are the symptoms that make up the substance use disorder diagnosis. And again, it's less important to focus on the specifics here and more important to notice the broader domains that are affected. People with a substance use disorder use a lot. They use frequently, oftentimes so much that their use gets in the way of doing other important things. They want to cut down or quit, but they're unable to do so. They keep using even though their use is causing them physical or psychological problems. And they experience um, evidence of uh, uh, physical addiction, so tolerance or um, withdrawal when they stop using or cut down. Okay, so we've talked a little bit now about what depression and substance use and abuse look like or their phenomenology. So now let's look, move into talking about how prevalent or how common they are. And we've gotten a lot of really great information, um, important information about prevalence in the United States from a number of large-scale nationwide studies like the National Comorbidity Survey here. And throughout the talk, just so you know, I've tried to include some of the original references um, for the, that provide the, the background for what, um, what I'm highlighting here today so that you can seek out additional information if you're interested in doing so. Um, this study here uh, reported on the results of the National Comorbidity Survey Replication. This uh, study assessed diagnoses of a range of mental disorders in a sample of over 10,000 adults. And there's a lot going on in this table. I don't mean to overwhelm you, but um, I'll, I'll let you take a look just for a couple of seconds, and then I'll, I'll walk through some of the important parts. So what we've got here is depressive disorders and then substance use disorders. And where I want you to, to focus at first is in that total column. So here you can see the rates of depressive and substance use disorders in the total sample of about 10,000 adults. And you can see that the lifetime prevalence of depressive disorders is somewhere around 20%, somewhere around one in five people reported um, experiencing a depressive disorder. And this number is pretty consistent with the rates from other um, large nationwide studies. And the lifetime prevalence of substance use disorders is around 15%. And then I next want to draw your attention to the age columns. Um, so here, this is where participants are grouped by age range. 
And you can see if you look across those columns that prevalence varies across the age and cohorts. So we have fairly stable rates through middle age, and then there's the lowest rates among the oldest participants. And we can debate exactly why that is in the oldest participants and whether that's um, an accurate um, rate, rate there. Um, and for these, uh, for these rates here um, in this study, these are all lifetime rates. So what this means is that the, the investigators are asking participants, looking back over your life, have you ever had a depressive or a substance use disorder? This study, uh, a related study by the same group of researchers, also reported on the results of the National Comorbidity Survey replication. This time they were asking participants just about the past 12 months. So in the past year, have you had a depressive or a substance use disorder? And again, there's a lot going on in this table, um, but I want you to focus on that total column. And you can see that past year prevalence of depressive disorders is around 7%. And substance use disorders is around 4%. If you add, if you go across the different disorders. And now the National Comorbidity Study, like I said, it, it assessed people just one time and it asked them to think back either over their entire lifetimes or over the last 12 months. And you can imagine that this approach might at some, and sometimes lead to, to missing some cases, like if people simply forget something that happened a long time ago, um, forget a depressive episode that was relatively short and that, that happened um, many, many years ago, they might, people might just forget about it. Um, so this study here took a different approach. In this study, participants were assessed every three to four years ago, starting from when they were teenagers. So there was less of a chance that they might forget something during those intervals. And what they, they found, so here they've got prevalence rates for a number of different studies, including the, the National Comorbidity Survey Replication, um, which I just showed you. And they have rates for studies that are assessing these, these disorders lifetime, looking back over your lifetime, and rates that are assessing these disorders prospectively, so at multiple time points over the lifetime. And this study found that when you assess people prospectively, you end up with much higher rates of depressive and substance use disorders. So here, rates of depression are more in the 30 to 40 percent range. Recall that they were around 20 percent in the, the previous study that I showed. And rates of substance use disorders are more in the 20 to 30 percent range. So that's um, about twice as many as in the, the earlier study. And so there's, there's evidence that when you assess these disorders prospectively, you get much higher rates than we, are, than we see in these um, single lifetime assessments. Um, the National Comorbidity Study uh, assessed adults. And studies have also examined mental disorders in children and adolescents. So for a long time, um, up until actually not too long ago, uh, it was assumed by many that children and adolescents weren't affected by mental disorders, that these were found only in adults. And we now know that not only can children and adolescents experience mental disorders, most disorders actually onset well before adulthood. And you can see here, for example, um, ADHD, conduct disorder, and anxiety disorders first emerge in children even younger than five years old. And the peak emergence is by 10 years old. Mood disorders, um, these include uh, depression and bipolar disorder, um, schizophrenia and substance abuse all tend to emerge, first emerge in adolescence. And overall, the average onset for any mental illness is right before 15 years old. So these are, these are coming out in adolescence. So most mental disorders first onset in childhood and in adolescence. And this study looked at the prevalence of mental disorders in children and adolescents. And again, a really busy table. Um, one thing to, to note here is that this is the three-month prevalence. So this is asking in the past three months, um, asking the, the children and their parents if they were experiencing these disorders. And again, I want you to, to focus at first on that total column. And it's clear that children and adolescents do experience depression and substance use disorders, even though rates are much lower um, in children than they are 
in adults. And looking across the age columns, we can see that the columns are split up by ages from nine and 10 year olds through 16 year olds. We can see that depression and substance use disorders increase during adolescence. So the rates get higher as children are aging. And then looking at the last two columns, you can also see that rates of depression and substance use disorders differ among girls and boys. And we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Another important nationwide study that's conducted on an ongoing basis is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health that's conducted in the United States and been going on for a while now. And these figures use data from that study and they illustrate the prevalence of depression during adolescence. So the figure on the left here gives the percentage of adolescents who reported a depressive disorder during the past 12 months. And the figure on the right gives the percentage of adolescents who reported a depressive disorder at some point in their lifetime through the age 18. And the important thing to notice here is how those percentages are going up over adolescence so that by the time people are 17 or 18 years old, their rates of depression are actually approaching adult rates. And these figures also use data from that same study from the National Survey on um, Drug Use and Health. Um, and they illustrate the prevalence of substance use during adolescence and into adulthood. And the figure on the left is for alcohol, um, any alcohol use at all, and then more problematic forms of alcohol use like binge use and heavy use. And then the figure on the right is for illegal drugs. And the important thing to notice here is how those percentages are going up over adolescence and into early adulthood with rates of problematic alcohol use and illegal drug use starting to go down after peaking in the early 20s. There's a pretty consistent pattern there. They go up pretty quickly and then they start coming down. And another ongoing nationwide study is Monitoring the Future. This study assesses adolescent substance use um, in eighth graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders. And it's been going on for several decades now and given us a lot of really important information about how adolescent substance use is changing over time. And this study finds that rates of binge drinking have gone down over the past 30 years among 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. You can see that they sort of peaked in the, the late 90s and have been steadily decreasing since then. Cigarette use has also gone down among 12th graders, but at the same time, marijuana use has been going up. And at the same time as smoking has gone down, rates of vaping are going up. And this is true for both nicotine and marijuana. Rates of illegal drug use seem to have largely been holding steady. But prescription misuse by adolescents has actually been going down. And that's a really positive sign um, just because of the, the opioid epidemic and um, uh, prescription misuse um, that's happening around the United States. And then I wanted to briefly touch on recreational marijuana legalization because this has been a major thing happening across the United States right now. And there's been a lot of concern about how legalization will affect adolescents. And research is still just getting going because recreational legalization is so recent. Um, but we are starting to get a picture that legalization is associated with increases in adult use. So this figure shows rates of marijuana use in young adults aged 18 to 25 in the United States. And then it's also got it uh, mapped out for Colorado, where recreational marijuana use was legalized a few years ago. Um, and then in Minnesota, where it's still illegal. And you can see that use in Minnesota, maybe it's been slowly going up a little bit along with the rest of the United States, um, but you can also see that use in Colorado is much higher. It's been going up much more quickly. So recreational marijuana legalization appears to increase adult use. But now contrast that with the figure on the right. And this is rates of marijuana use in adolescents aged 12 to 17. And you can see that use is really holding steady in both marijuana, uh, Minnesota and in Colorado. 
And most of the recent research is suggesting that not only does recreational legalization not lead to an increase in adolescent marijuana use, it might even lead to slight decreases in adolescent use. And this is a really a potentially interesting and important finding that um, people are, are working to better understand. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears to etiology um, or the, the cause or origins of depression and substance use and abuse. And we can think about etiology as asking where do depression and substance use come from? And this question is asking, uh, it's sort of getting at that long standing nature versus nurture question or genes versus environment. This is a, a debate that ha had been going on in the field. Um, there were certainly decades where people insisted it was either one or it was the other, it was all genes or it was all environment. And it's now pretty clear that it's some combination of both nature and nurture. Uh, some combination of our genes and our environmental experiences together combined to make some people more likely to experience depression or substance abuse or both. And there have been a number of studies that have examined the relative contribution of genes and environmental experiences both to depression and to substance use. And the general conclusion, if you read across these studies, um, and if you meta-analyze the results, the general conclusion is that genes account for about 40% of the variance in depression and about 50% of the variance in substance abuse. And this is important to know because, first off, it tells us that genes are important for these disorders, but it also tells us that environment is at least as important. And now when I say that genes are important, unlike what these popular magazines would like you to believe, there is no single gene for depression or for substance use or abuse. We don't get a gene that makes us have it or not have it. Instead, recent advances in genetics research now makes it clear that there are very, very small effects across hundreds or thousands of genetic variants that lead to depression or substance use. So here, this is um, what's called a Manhattan plot. Um, and what this, what this plot is doing is illustrating effects for genetic variants um, across the chromosomes. And it's meant to look like skyscrapers in Manhattan. And what we're looking here, uh, what we're looking for here is effects that cross those, that red, those red dashed lines, um, sort of in the, the middle lower part of that figure. Um, effects that cross that line mean that they're significant, that they're, they're making a contribution. But those effects are really, really, really small, and there's a lot of them. So it's clear from this study, that this study actually included almost a million participants, um, that many, many genes have very small effects on depression and substance use and abuse, and it's the collective total of those effects across those different genes that, are, um, that, that contribute to increasing the risk of developing depression or substance use and abuse. And then it's also important to remember that when we talk about the environment, we're talking about everything that isn't genes. That's sort of how it's defined. So we're talking about the early rearing or the family environment. We're talking about friends and peer groups. We're talking about neighborhoods, schools, communities, air pollution, um, green space. And it's also important to remember that our environmental experiences start even before we're born, uh, what we call the intrauterine environment. And so people will, will sometimes think the environment is uh, composed entirely of um, your, your early family experiences, but it, it's much broader than that. So we know that certain environmental experiences influence depression and substance use and abuse. Um, but we also know that genes are associated with and interact with aspects of the environment, again, in ways that might make a person more or less likely to experience depression or substance use. So let's talk a little bit about some risk factors for depression and substance use and abuse. And this is um, a, quite a large focus of my research, but it's also an area where I think things are, uh, can be pretty um, undefinitive. Um, so we, we are still actively trying to, to figure out what the risk factors are with the idea that if we can figure out the risk factors that hopefully we can try to prevent them from occurring or we can try to identify people who are at risk and then um, stop these disorders from developing in the first place. So today I'm going to focus on some of the risk factors that I consider to be the most predictive. Um, it's certainly not an exhaustive list of risk factors um, that are out there, um, but some of the ones that I think are 
uh, it's pretty well established are pretty important uh, for, for predicting who's going to develop depression or substance use. So we know that most mental disorders in adulthood are preceded by mental disorders in childhood and adolescence. So depression and substance use and abuse, like I said, they tend to onset in adolescence, they continue into adulthood, but they're preceded by symptoms that emerge much earlier, oftentimes in childhood. Depression is often preceded by childhood anxiety. Substance use and abuse is often preceded by childhood disruptive disorders. These include oppositional behavior, conduct disorder, and ADHD. So childhood anxiety disorders tend to predict later depressive disorders. Childhood disruptive disorders tend to predict later substance use disorders. But there's crossover too. Um, and as I, as I just mentioned, depression and substance abuse also tend uh, to, to co-occur um, in adolescence and into adulthood. So knowing that a person experienced a disorder in childhood helps us predict whether they'll experience a disorder in adolescence or adulthood, but it's not necessarily a specific predictor of which disorder. Temperamental risk is a somewhat more specific predictor. And when I say temperament here, I'm referring to a person's general disposition or their tendency to think or feel or act in a particular way. And the tripartite model of depression and anxiety posits that negative affect, this is the tendency to experience negative mood, negative emotions, stress, uh, that negative affect is a general risk factor for both depression and for anxiety. Um, but that low positive affect, so that's a tendency to not experience positive moods, um, that low positive affect is a specific risk factor for depression, whereas anxious arousal, um, this is a sort of hypervigilance or a, a, a focus on physical symptoms, um, that anxious arousal is a specific risk factor for anxiety. So high negative affect and low positive affect predict depression. And there's actually some evidence that low positive affect might be particularly important for those more chronic forms of depression that I mentioned earlier. And there's also evidence of temperamental risk for substance use and abuse um, in the form of behavioral disinhibition. So this is this figure's got a lot going on. This is a, a figure that's um, looking at the how um, externalizing psychopathology, including substance use, might develop over time. Um, but the parts that I want you to pay attention to are over here. Here we have a liability to behavioral disinhibition that's defined by a lack of control, aggressiveness, impulsivity. And that predicts the later development of substance use and abuse. Um, but it also predicts antisocial behavior more generally. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, sex, whether you're male or female, is another important predictor of both depression and substance use. And there's actually a really interesting pattern of depression onset among boys and girls. So here, um, this, this um, paper was from 1998, but this effect has, has continued to replicate over the last several decades. Um, here you can see that in early adolescence, rates of depressive disorders are pretty similar for boys and girls. And they're relatively low and pretty similar. And then all of a sudden, right around age 15, rates jump up. And this is true for both boys and girls, um, but it's especially true for girls. And by the time, um, by the time boys and girls are in, their, in early adulthood, um, that rate is right around two to one. Um, so girls are about twice as likely to develop depression than boys. And this continues into adulthood. Women are about twice as likely to have depression um, as are men. And there are also sex differences in substance use. Um, but here it's in the opposite direction. Men tend to have higher rates of use. And this figure shows um, rates of uh, rates of drinking and tobacco use on the, the left side among women and men. And then on the right hand side, we've got um, rates of illegal substance use. And you can see that pretty consistently, men are using more substances than women. But there's evidence that this might actually be changing, at least for alcohol. So there's been a pretty well established, um, what's called a gender gap in rates of drinking um, for, for men and women. And there's 
evidence that that gap might be shrinking, um, might be um, the, the gap is getting smaller. And this, this review paper um, reviewed the, the studies that are out there on uh, rates of alcohol use in men and women um, over the past couple of decades and found that drinking among women and, and especially among middle and uh, women in middle and older adulthood, um, drinking is rapidly increasing. Um, so the, the gender gap is shrinking and the reason it's shrinking is that men are either holding steady or decreasing their drinking just a little bit and at the same time, especially among um, middle-aged and older um, women, they're starting to drink um, more and more and so that gap is really starting to, to narrow. Um, and this, this um, has been so notable, these authors called this an epidemic of women's drinking. And then the last key risk factor that I'm going to mention today is familial risk. So we know from studying families across generations that both depression and substance use are transmitted through families, meaning that they're passed from parent to child from one generation to the next. Children of a depressed parent are about three times as likely to develop depression themselves. Children of a substance abusing parent are about twice as likely to abuse substances themselves. So depression and substance use and abuse are transmitted through families. Um, but there's also crossover. So children of depressed or substance abusing parents are also more likely to experience other disorders too. So parental disorders predict mental disorders in general. Um, they don't necessarily breed true. Um, so having a parent with depression or who abuses substances increases the likelihood of developing depression or substance abuse or other forms of psychopathology, other mental disorders. So if I were on a game show, if I were on who wants to be a millionaire and I could win by predicting who would be most likely to develop a depressive or substance use disorder, the things I'd most want to know um, would be, did they have a childhood history of disorder? What's their temperament? Are they male or female? And did their parents have a disorder? These are what I would consider to be the most predictive risk factors. Okay, and so I'm going to, to end today's talk um, talking a little bit more about comorbidity and co-occurrence. Um, and just as a reminder, um, comorbidity is experiencing two or more disorders during the lifetime, whereas co-occurrence is experiencing them both at the same time or sequentially. And I would say my, my sort of read of the, the literature and the research that's out there is that we as a field um, are doing pretty well in terms of comorbidity, in terms of understanding um, the, the comorbidity across depression and substance use and, and other uh, mental disorders. I'd say that um, research on co-occurrence, um, there's, there's still um, work to be done. Um, I, it, it's a really, really interesting and important question um, that people are trying to answer and it's, it's a hard thing to do well. Um, and I'd say the research is still um, maybe I'd even say in its infancy, but we'll talk a little bit more about, about that. So first off, in terms of comorbidity um, and co-occurrence, people who use or abuse one substance are also much more likely to use or abuse other substances. So for example, smoking and drinking, uh, marijuana use, all of those things uh, go together. People who abuse substances are also more likely to have antisocial behavior. Um, and we can see that substance abuse tends to be highly comorbid with antisocial behavior. This is, is defined by um, uh, disregard for the rights of other people, aggressiveness, impulsiveness. And depression tends to be highly comorbid with anxiety. And in fact, all of these disorders tend to be pretty highly comorbid with each other. And we can model that comorbidity those associations between these disorders using uh, an internalizing factor where symptoms are directed inward and an externalizing factor where symptoms are directed outward. And in the same way that depression and anxiety tend to be correlated with that one another, substance abuse and antisocial behavior tend to be correlated with one another forming those internalizing and externalizing factors. Those internalizing and externalizing factors are correlated with one another. Um, so people who experience any of these disorders are also more likely to experience other disorders.
And this is a pretty well-established finding now um, in, uh, in children and uh, adolescents and adults, and it's been um, documented around the world. And if you're at all interested in comorbidity, I'm not trying to, to scare anyone here with this figure, but if you're interested in comorbidity and modeling it across different disorders, I'm gonna just put in a, a plug here. I'm gonna highly recommend that you check out the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology. It's high top. Um, you can Google it. They have a website. Um, and this is a consortium of psychologists and psychiatrists who are working together to better understand the nature of psychopathology how these different symptoms and disorders all um, link up together to form symptoms. So depression and substance abuse are highly comorbid with each other and with other mental disorders. And this model of psychopathology has been really important for how we understand mental disorders. Um, but it doesn't tell us much about how depression and substance use and abuse are related to or influence each other over time. So I, I really like, um, I, I think this model is a really helpful way for organizing and understanding how disorders are, are related to one another. Um, but most of this research has been, uh, it's been very static, meaning that you're assessing lifetime rates. Um, you might have had depression in adolescence and now you're abusing substances in middle age. Um, and those things are correlated, um, but it doesn't tell you that much about how those things are related over time. It doesn't give you a very dynamic understanding of, of how these disorders are, are occurring with one another. Um, and for my interest, how they're developing, um, that's a really important thing that I'm, I'm quite interested in. And so to, to try to get at that, you can try to, um, try to get a better handle on co-occurrence over time. And there are a number of different ways that depression and substance use and abuse could co occur over time. Um, one popular hypothesis that many of you are probably, have probably heard of is that substance abuse is a form of self-medication of depressive symptoms. So depression is um, negative mood um, and maybe, um, maybe people are using substances as a way of uh, coping with that negative mood or maybe they're using substances as a way of bringing up Low, po low positive mood. Another hypothesis is that substance abuse leads to depression, um, either through physiological effects um, or an effect of substance use on functioning that, that itself leads to depression. Like maybe a person's drinking might lead to a divorce and that might lead to a depressive episode. Another hypothesis is that depression and substance use start out unrelated, but that each exacerbates the other over time. And it's, it's really hard to conduct research that can definitively differentiate between these hypotheses um, for, for various reasons, um, including that it's hard to assess people in a fine-grained enough way to determine what comes first, depression or substance use, because that's, I think, really the, the crux of what people are interested in is, and trying to differentiate between these hypotheses is, did depression come first? Did substance use come first? Um, and, does that happen over a long period of time? But, but also, does that happen, you know, even within an hour? Is there depressed, like a depressed mood um, that then leads to substance abuse in that, in that moment in time? And this study, this, this study was trying to get at just the temporal ordering. So, so really, which came first? Um, and the way that they did that was they simply asked people to report on when they first experienced different mental disorders. And they found that among men, so here we've got um, uh, split out among men and women. So what they found that um, among men, substance use disorder tended to occur prior to depression in the majority of cases. So men were saying, I first had my substance use disorder, and then later on, I had a depressive disorder. But there was less of a clear pattern among women. So among women, mood disorders occurred prior to substance use disorder in about uh, almost half of the people, but, it, but the opposite direction happened. Um, so substance use disorders happened before um, mood disorders in about 40% of people. So it's, a, it's a less of a clear pattern for women than for men. <laughs> 
And there, you know, this study um, is an important study um, because it is um, giving us some information about temporal ordering, but there's some limitations to it uh, too, of course, um, where the, the study is asking people to look back over their lives and report on what came first. Um, and probably uh, uh, a, a good approach would be to be following people over time um, and following them and asking them um, repeatedly um, and with less time in between assessments, um, whether they have depression, whether they're using substances. That sort of research is um, really important to be conducting. It's, um, it's hard to do and it's expensive um, and it, creates a, it can create a burden on participants. And so um, that type of research is few and far between, but also really important to really get at how are these disorders occurring over time and how are they related to one another. Okay, so I know that I was only able to touch on some aspects in today's webinar, but I hope that I was able to, to cover some of the important things and convey some of what I think is a really interesting area of research. Um, and I know I, I've sort of been glancing up at some of the comments and I know that people have asked a couple of questions. Um, I am more than happy to answer questions now and then I've also got um, some contact information here if anybody um, is interested in following up at a, another time. So can I open it up to questions? What's the best way to do that? Thank you, Celia. Yes, so much great information as evidenced by the myriad questions coming in. Coming in. Um, Peter, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna present a couple real quick and then we'll go back and forth, okay? Sounds good. The first question, um, some of us missed or misunderstood some when you were touching on double depression. Could you elaborate on that? Please. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back through all my slides and try to pull it up. So, yeah, so double depression is this idea that um, a person can experience a dysthymic episode. That's the two years or longer period of um, feeling depressed for about half the time. Um, and that they can also experience a major depressive episode. And a major depressive episode is two... Um, defined by two weeks or longer of feeling depressed most of the time. Um, and people can experience, I think of it as, you know, a, a major depressive episode on top of your dysthymic episode. And so you're experiencing two types of depression, which is why they call it double depression. Um, so it, it, I'm, uh, if you think about it clinically, it's a person who's been in a, um, you know, a moderately depressed mood for a really long period of time and then they experience a, a briefer period of time of much worse mood and all of the depressive symptoms that go into a major depressive episode. Does that help? Yes, thank you so much. Um, the next question um, from Carly asks, when you say appetite, this was early on as well, when you say appetite, can it also mean both eating too much or yeah. eating nothing, or is it one or the other? No, that's a great question. Yes, um, so it can definitely mean eating too much, eating too little. Um, it can mean um, it can mean weight gain, weight loss, um, and then similar thing for the sleeping. Um, it can either be sleeping too much or sleeping too little. Um, so different people might experience um, might experience different types of appetite or sleep disturbances. Um, and different people in, di in different depressive episodes might experience um, in one, they might um, have appetite loss and then in another, they might have ap uh, appetite gain. Great, thank you. Peter, you have some questions too? Let's go back and forth here. Yeah, okay. Um, and I, you may have answered this, uh, Celia. It's, the question is, do seniors get depression differently than those who are younger? And if so, do they show the same signs? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, and I, I'll, I'll preface it by saying that I'm not an expert in, uh, in depression at older ages. I'm, I'm more familiar with the younger ages. Um, I could imagine, I'm sort of going off of what, I, what I'm imagining right now, but I could imagine that it might look somewhat different and it might look somewhat different um, for what I would call cohort effects. Um, so people who, um, people who are, are older now, you know, they grew up in a different time where maybe there were different expectations around mood um, and what people are sort of allowed to, um, to experience and allowed to feel. And so it could be 
that older people um, experience and ex express depression um, maybe more somatically, so maybe more in terms of um, the physical, um, physical manifestation of symptoms, um, or they might experience depression more as like an irritability as opposed to a, um, a more, more signs of classic sadness. Okay. Um, another question here. Um, have you seen any connections with CBD oils and products connected with further chemical dependency? Because I have had clients switch from uh, mm -hmm. like marijuana to it in hopes to help with their recovery. Yeah, another great question. Again, outside of my area of expertise, I, I am sure that people are interested in this and I'm sure people are doing research on it. Um, but I'm not familiar with that research. That, that actually would be a really interesting thing to, to learn a little bit more about because I, I, I agree, people seem to be um, using that quite a bit and a lot of people are, are reporting that it's helpful, um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the, the research is saying about that. Okay, thank you. Joe? Space bar, sorry. <laughs> You know what, I'm just gonna unmute here. Rachel has familial risk factors. Is that by nature or nurture? For example, children whose parents have depression but were raised by someone else. So Rachel, this is a, a fantastic question. This is actually a major um, interest of mine and a major focus of my research. Um, so, so yes, um, people who have parents who are depressed say um, their children are more likely to become depressed. Those parents are passing on their genes and they're creating a rearing environment um, that might in and of itself um, make a, a child more likely to develop depression. Um, there is um, really interesting research um, that, that really, uh, research that looks at adopted children um, with adoptive parents. Um, and one, one in particular that I can think of that actually came out of the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research found that children of adoptive parents um, who were depressed, the adoptive parents were depressed, were more likely to have depression themselves. And this suggests that there is actually something about being reared by a parent with depression that increases the likelihood of depression even beyond the genetic factors. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, okay. Um, so, is there any data on skipping generations in relation to substance abuse? For example, mm -hmm. a parent never abused or misused drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. but there still was substance use disorder in the next generation. Mm -hmm. There probably is. I'm not as familiar with that, um, like a three generation study. Um, it's an interesting question because I could imagine a a child who experiences a parent who abuses substances and makes the very conscious decision to not um, use substances and thereby prevents developing the substance use them disorder themselves, but that their child who experiences that same genetic liability, maybe without the sort of cautionary tale of, of the parent, um, might try substances and develop a disorder. Another really good question, I, I can speculate, but I'm, but I'm not sure exactly what the research shows. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, two questions I'm gonna to put together here for you, Celia. Um, Veronica says, where can I find a copy of the higher order dimension chart? And Stephanie asked, did tobacco laws change to 21 in Minnesota? Ah, good questions. So uh, you can find a copy of the, the higher, the, it's the hierarchical uh, taxonomy of, of psychopathology. Um, and you can find it by Googling high top, H-I-T-O-P. Um, it's, uh, it's headed up by, um, by Roman Kotov at Stony Brook University. Um, exactly. Thanks, Joe. And then um, I don't think that the, the age has changed in Minnesota. Um, I believe that it is still 18. Honestly, it's, it's been, <laughs> I, I am not out buying cigarettes these days, so I really, <laughs> I don't know, it, but I don't think, I think it's still 18. I think, I think some communities have changed it to 21. Okay. Okay, so that's interesting. Yeah, not, not throughout the state, but um, specific, Got it. yeah. Got it. Perfect. 
Um, Luke asks, do you believe that substance abuse is limited to drugs, alcohol, and tobacco, or can other products be used as, you know, can be abused, such yes. as you know, fatty foods, caffeine, et cetera? Yeah, it's a really good question. There's a lot of, a lot of people are interested in this question. Um, so it's like, like uh, addictive behaviors, say maybe if you might think about it that way. So um, gambling is one, pathological gambling is one thing people have been interested in. Um, video games, there's been um, some research on sort of what you might consider to be like compulsive um, video gaming. Um, and I, I would say that I think about, so, so we have the, the sort of addictive properties of some of these substances, and then there are also potentially addictive properties of um, fatty foods or, um, or winning in a, in a poker game or something like that. And people who have an underlying tendency to, um, uh, underlying tendency to, to want those rewarding, um, those rewarding experiences, um, might be more likely um, to to develop an addiction across to, across substances or across things. Um, people who have uh, difficulty inhibiting impulsive behaviors um, would also, um, I would expect, be more likely um, to have have trouble um, with substances and other things like that. Thank you, Celia. So we're running short on time here. Um, do you have time with uh, to answer one more question with us, sure. Dr. Wilson? Sure. Thank you. Suzanne asks, how do researchers account for social pressures that may lead men or boys to be less likely to acknowledge mood disorders when yeah. looking at what comes first, mood disorder or substance abuse, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, you know, I, I put up that that little overview about the sex differences um, in, in depression, because it's a, it's a really established, well-established finding. Um, but I, I don't know, um, and I don't think the field knows. Um, there is a lot of speculation of, that's tried to, to explain or understand what is that two to one difference. Um, people have wondered, is it hormones? Um, is it you know, the difference between testosterone and estrogen? Um, a lot of people have speculated about the social pressures, which I think is a really valid, um, valid point of speculation that it, if you are in a culture where men are less allowed to express sadness or less allowed to um, express negative moods other than anger, um, then they are less likely to be reporting that they're experiencing depression and, and maybe even less likely to recognize that they're experiencing depression. Um, so, so I think it's, you know, it, it's pretty amazing that, that that study came out in 1998. So it's now been, you know, 20, over 20 years. Um, and I, I don't know that we've, I, we still don't know um, what the, the explanation for that is. It's a great question. You could spend an entire career on it. Mm -hmm. So um, just before we end here, I, for people who may be interested in um, some, another webinar that we've done that's, that's similar to this um, is the ABCD study um, information that was done by um, Dr. Uh, Monica Luciana and Dr. William Anacoco, Anac Iacono. It's on our past webinars website and the, there's a, definitely twins uh, study information that might be useful. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you, Celia. That concludes today's presentation. On behalf of the Center for Practice Transformation, we'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to join us. It was so engaging. Thank you for the great questions. Um, and we'd like to extend an extra special thanks to Dr. Celia Wilson for sharing her time and talents and such great information. Thank you, Celia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Really great questions. I, I, it's very fun to talk about these sorts of things. So thank you. Thanks again. Stay safe, stay healthy, and socially connected. And we hope to see you next month on June 12th.